Hi. And as primary school teachers, we just wanted to come down and say about to turn on all of your mics, just so it would be nice. Excellent. Good to know. Sizzling start. Yeah. That's good. And your background? Um, I'm ex-Google. Um, but now I wear a number of hats. One is um, I have a leadership development company working mainly with tech companies. And to know a bit about education. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at Google, I did, I did quite a lot of education. Too. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us here for our final quarterly event for the Studio Women's Network this evening. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge country. Before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional landowners, uh, owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. As we share knowledge today, may we also pay respects to the knowledge embedded forever with the, uh, within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Again. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our final quarterly event for the Studio Women's Network. We have had some amazing topics this year and this evening's topic will be just as rewarding to listen to. Um, before I go any further though, I'd love to bring up our CEO and founder of the studio, Chantal Abushar, who'd like to say a couple words about this year. Thank you, Claire. So we're a really small team at the studio. There's myself, the amazing Claire Tester, our events and marketing manager, and Carol Friel Evans, our um, community manager. So we're, we're running a tech startup hub, three women. Um, so pretty, pretty amazing. Um, we usually do have another um, uh, gentleman on our, on our team, but he's gone to live in Orange, but so we'll have, we'll have a new person. Um, we scared him off. Uh, so thank you for coming tonight. Uh, the Studio Women's Network was founded because even though I knew the, the figures, the, the, the stats around you know, women in tech, uh, women starting tech startups, sit between about 10 to 20% internationally and, and locally, um, I was just shocked when we opened our doors to the studio on the 1st of March last year to just see how few women there were. So uh, with that in mind, we, we really wanted to um, establish uh, something that, that was easy for us to do that would just be able to really um, champion women um, who are working in the sector, who are starting amazing businesses and, um, and just create these opportunities for everyone to get together to network and to realise that anyone can start a tech startup. I'm not saying it's easy, um, but hopefully tonight you'll pick up some insights as to what it takes to create a truly global company. Um, so I'll let, uh, who's going to take over, Claire's going to take I'd also just like to quickly acknowledge Paul McCarthy, the chairman of the studio who's here tonight. Thank you, Paul. And um, the studio board. Of, and the studio board of directors. So the studio is a not-for-profit organisation, so the board members give their time uh, for free and we're very grateful for that. We would not have the organisation we have without our incredible chairman and our board of directors. Thanks, Claire. Excellent. So shortly I will be introducing our two panellists and then we will have a very interesting Q&A um, for this evening, followed by questions from yourself. The panel will be conducted by Claire. I would just like you all to note that my name is Claire. Two of the other women are Claire. Jenny chose <laughs> not to change her name this evening to make it easier for all of us, so you'll have to remember Jenny as well. <laughs> uh, first up, I would like to welcome uh, Claire Lehman, uh, <laughs> founder and editor-in-chief of Quillette. She'll give you a brief description of her organization. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Chantal. Thanks, Paul. It's lovely to be here, and it's lovely so I've actually been asked to tell my story. This is actually the first time since I created Quillette that I'm actually telling my story. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it's special for me. 
Um, I often get asked what the meaning of the word collect is. So it's a French word for a wicker off cutting which you plant into the ground and grows into a tree. And when I was brainstorming ideas, brainstorming names for this website I wanted to create, um, I stumbled across the word Quillette and I looked it up and I saw what it meant and I thought that's a wonderful metaphor for what an idea can do. So my, web, my platform is all about big ideas. And I thought, uh, you know, if you have an idea and you write it up into an essay and you publish it online, it can, you know, transform the world. So I thought it was a nice metaphor for an essay. Turns out it's also a good metaphor for a company. Um, I started Colette at the end of 2015 and essentially um, I started it because I, was, I needed to solve a problem and that problem was I had a baby at home and I needed to work from home. I needed intellectual fulfillment. I was struggling in my master's program at university. Um, I ended up dropping out because I couldn't meet the requirements of that program and I was quite depressed over that and so to uh, cope with that I thought well I'm going to start my own thing and I'm going to work from home and so that's what I did. Uh, and it began, the website began as a hobby and it sort of became accidentally successful. <laughs> I, I say accidentally because a lot of hard work has gone into it but um, we are also quite lucky in that, it, I mean, we, we've benefited from a lot of luck and being in the right place at the right time. So now I have um, an international team of editors all over the world. I have two editors in London. I have an editor in Toronto and an editor in Stockholm. Um, we receive one million unique visitors a month, three million page views. I've published some very um, well-regarded authors and writers, people like Stephen Pinker, Matt Ridley, Cass Sunstein, um, many others, like the list goes on. I've published hundreds of contributors. Um, one of my favourite stories is um, we've published a young man called Coleman Hughes, uh, who's a young undergraduate philosophy major in New York, and he's he's African American and he's uh, he plays in Rihanna's backup band, but he's also a genius <laughs> philosopher, and he's written essays for us, and he was invited to testify before the U.S. Congress on the back of the essays he's written for my little website that I created <laughs> on my couch. So I mean, it's, an, it's just a, amazing for us as editors that young people come to us who have never been discovered by anyone before. We give them a plat we edit their work, we've given them a platform, and their ideas literally go on to impact the world. Um, it's been a remarkable adventure for me, personally. Um, I come from Adelaide, I grew up in Port Adelaide, which is quite a uh, modest socio-economic um, neighbourhood. Um, but because of this work that I've been doing, I've been invited to speak all over the world. I recently got back from uh, an event in Bordeaux, France, which I would never have gone to, you know, if it weren't, if it weren't for me being involved with Quillette. Um, some of my writers have secured book deals through writing for Colette, and one of my writers is currently working on a script, was invited to work on a script for a Netflix series. So we're really happy about that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and, but the funny thing is actually, is that we're not very well known here in Australia. Only 4% of my readership is located in Australia. Um, and most of my speaking invitations are in the United States and Europe. I don't really know why that is. I mean, this is the first time I'm speaking about Quillette to a live audience, but I have been invited to speak about Quillette um, by CNN, but not by, not by the ABC. So there's a, some disconnect in Australia, and I think, I don't know what it is, but I think maybe in Australia we don't have the same culture of entrepreneurship as they do in the United States, and potentially we don't um, seek out entrepreneurs, and we don't, it's not a narrative that we're familiar with. I think hopefully things are changing, and of course with um, initiatives like the studio. I mean, this has been the most welcoming and um, inclusive environment I've, I've had the, uh, the luck to work in, in Australia. 
Um, so I'm really happy about that. <laughs> but otherwise, I have to go to the US to get the same kind of energy and the support. Uh, so I think it's fantastic that the studio exists. Um, now, I think that the, the, the lack of focus or the lack of culture of entrepreneurship in Australia is bad for women in a way because um, we often emphasise very traditional corporate career tracks for female empowerment, but I think there's nothing more empowering for women than being your own boss, mm -hmm. particularly if you want to have a family. I'm not saying that entrepreneurship is easy, it isn't, but if your child is sick, at least you don't have to ask the boss to take a day off. You are in charge of your own hours. You have flexibility. You can work from home. Uh, those kind of benefits are immeasurable. They're invaluable. Um, and we also need to be aware that with social media and with um, advances in technology, it's becoming easier and easier for people to start their own business is you don't actually need a whole lot of upfront capital to start a business. Um, I certainly didn't have upfront capital. I raised a little bit of money through the process, but mostly it's been done through crowdfunding. Um, I didn't have to pitch to a VC to get started. Uh, and one can build an audience on social media through Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. One can build an audience so you can have a market in place ready to go for when you have a product to sell. And it's becoming easier and easier for us to monetize our passions and our hobbies, um, which I think is great for women because I know for myself and many of my, friend, my female friends, we're really, um, we, we want to engage in work that we find meaningful and that we're passionate about. It's less so much about the status or the, you know, the six-figure salary. It's about making a difference in the world. It's about doing what we love. And so because it's easier now to make careers out of doing what you love, I think we really should be talking more about entrepreneurship and uh, women becoming entrepreneurs. Um, and this, is, this was something that I thought about in my 20s. I often thought, you know, the traditional career track is designed by men for men and the nine to five, Monday to Friday, nine to five setup sort of rests on the assumption that you have a wife at home cooking you dinner and <laughs> you know, you're gonna get home and all of the housework is done. So having flexibility, having different work models, um, I think will open up opportunities for women and allow women to contribute to society more than ever before. Um, and another benefit of being an entrepreneur when you're a woman is you don't have to compete with men to get promoted. If you start, if you start your own company, if you start your own company, you're automatically the boss. Um, I employ five people. Four of them, I've employed more than that, but my team is um, has contracted at the moment. But four of the people that I employ are men who are quite a lot older than me. Um, but I'm the one who pays their wages and they respect me automatically because I'm the boss. And it's, it's fabulous. It's, it's, very, it's very empowering and it's, um, it's, a, it's a fabulous way to go through your career being in charge. <laughs> um, I'll just finish by saying what can be more empowering than that. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'll just go back. Uh, next up, I'd like to welcome up to the stage Jenny Atkinson, founder and CEO of Little Scribe, to tell us a little about Little Scribe. Thank you. We are the story of lots of little stories. And those stories are changing the world as we speak. So one of the most interesting questions that has been part of our journey is this one. Why are there no library of books? 
written by kids, for kids. And when you ask that question to kids, we get some beautiful responses. And it's really fascinating. And what we've discovered is we've quoted a lot of rules around the right to write for kids. And one of those is you've got to be big. The second is I can't spell yet, or not correctly. And the third part of that is it's a really big task. And so we've actually quoted some really silent rules around the right for children to write and to create a library of books written by kids for kids. When we asked that question of adults, we pretty much got exactly the same responses. And so here's an interesting one, particularly from the big people, and particularly, dare I say, from publishers, and dare I say, from librarians, which is, if the spelling's not right, it can't be a book. And so we've got this beautiful little pyramid that's created a rule. And then I just quietly come up and say, are there any books in your library, and I don't say this to the kids, that are full of crap? <laughs> the answer is yes. So we're allowing content that's perhaps not that fabulous in a library. That's OK, because the spelling's all right. Really interesting. So imagine if we've got some beautiful content, and the journey of spelling is part of the process. And we're not letting that turn up and come to life. So tonight I thought I'd actually take you on a journey of what that looks like. What does the library of books written by kids, for kids, look like? And on that journey we discovered a few things. They're amazing writers and they've got stories to tell. They're really important and we've got a lot to learn. One of the gems and the pivots in this process is we assumed, I specifically assumed, that the ability to teach writing was an embedded skill set within our teachers. 55% of teachers in the US don't feel skilled and confident to teach writing. And if you looked at Four Corners two weeks ago, you saw exactly the same direct communication around our teachers not having the skill or the comfort to teach writing. And it is the bedrock of our education. Yesterday, PISA and the results for Australia were pretty disturbing. Yeah. And what was interesting in this, and think about these other rules, is we've got science where we've gone backwards, maths we've gone backwards, and reading. Where was the writing conversation? And here's the fascinating piece. Every single one of those applications required the kids to respond in writing. So what that means is our kids' ability to share their knowledge in a form that we understand isn't on par, and we've lost a year of educational outcomes in the last 10 years for our kids. We're going backwards. And so one of the questions is why is that occurring? And certainly technology is part of the problem, it's also part of the solution. And so what we find is we've got this extraordinary human technology, and we've turned it off. When we use handwriting, we're increasing our memory by 200%. It's your personal code. And the data shows us, both through UCLA and Edutopia, and I'm happy to show you some of that research later, that says that when you handwrite, that you do increase it by 200%. And what you're doing is you're putting that down onto muscle memory, and it's easier for concepts to come back out and to glue them together in a way that you can now share with your audience, and they understand what you now understand. And that fundamental skill when I'm talking about writing is the skill that we've lost or our kids are losing. So this is what a library of books looks like by kids. And our gem of an idea that was a big pivot is we said, what would happen, and I pitched this literally to the day a year ago, and I'll be able to share with you what's happened in a year. What would happen if J.K. Rowling was to write the first two pages of a story and kids would write the rest of the story? the one that's in their mind. And so we now have 25 authors on board. Jackie French, Andrew Datto, Tristan Banks, Oliver Pomavan, that have come on board and they've given us the rights to existing books and they've written original work. And they've become the story starters and the kids are now responsible for the rest of the story. So you're gonna see some of that work that's coming through. So this is what a digital library looks like and our platform takes handwriting and digital makes it into an instant digital book or calendar, which is a book in hiding, a poster 
or a form of a card and it's fit for purpose to print and within two weeks of that order coming through we're delivering books to schools around the country and in their library they've now got books written by their students and they've created a digital library, a classroom library and a school library. We've got libraries all around the country now being shared. So Jo, I think we might go to one of the books and actually show you what that looks like. So we've got the boat, and this is with Andrew Dado. Here's a fascinating thing. This is Andrew Dado's handwriting and his illustrations. And I said, I need you to actually do it in handwriting. Because when our kids see books, they see perfection. They don't see pride, purpose, and progress. They see perfection. And that's a really big hurdle. So he said, but I can't write, or I can't, draw, I can't hand write, or I can't draw. Their conversations happen every day in classrooms, and we need to debunk that and get rid of those rules. And if we keep working through here, you're now seeing this story come to life. This is a kindergarten kid. And this is an extraordinary story. We have a huge capability in this country. And we've turned off the drive to write because of our drive for data. And we forgot purpose. So we thought towards the end of Christmas, you should see what's sitting around our classrooms and what the capability is in the hearts and the minds of our kids. <laughs> in here we have over 30 curriculum outcomes. This is 30 hours of deep learning that's turning up in this book. And I'd like to show you now Deborah Avella. Scrappy. And I just want to show you once we move through, and now we, what's really fascinating for us is we started in primary school in a very short period of time. We just had our first request for HSC 5th and 6th form, and we've already been writing for 4th uh, form. So we've already hit the high school market in a very short period of time, and that context is we went live in July this year. Last week we had our biggest week, and I can share with you we've now got 850 new authors around the country. 13,500 pages of writing, and that's 70,000 hours of deep learning outcome. <laughs> Look at this extraordinary capability. Jo, what age? I'm sorry. This is year six, so 11, 12, 13, uh -huh. And then what I'd like to show you is the story started, Jo, is that? So this is Deborah's work, again handwritten. And we do have existing published work, but it's about kids seeing what's possible and connecting. And the video, should we have a look at that? In, our, in fact, sorry Joe, I've jumped around. Let's go to the platform. So what I want to show you is, I think this is a really important part. You're seeing the output, but what's the input? How are scaffolding and supporting teachers and kids to get really good information to break it down? Every single piece of our writing platforms has around 30 pages of documentation connected to the curriculum around the country and offshore. We have videos by authors inviting kids to write with them. And we've also got videos breaking down skills like speech bubbles and graphic novels. On top of that, we then have every single one as a lesson plan and every lesson plan, they can then use their big digital platform in the classroom and start sharing and illustrating this with the kids. One of the most important things is this can be downloaded and customised. So we are catering for those teachers in particular that don't feel skilled or new to the market. And those that have really got the capability going, wow, that's great, I want to add some things to it, so they can customise it. I think that gives you a feel for it. Um, James Foley, we might quickly go to the video there. I just want to show you some of the things that our kids are learning and actually implementing what we're seeing coming through. Speech bubbles have a tail that points towards the character's mouth. You can also have thought bubbles that have a trail of little bubbles, like little bits of popcorn, and they always trail back towards the character's brain because that's where the thought is coming from. When you're drawing a speech bubble, it's important to write the words first, then put the bubble around it. If you draw the bubble first and then try to fit the words inside, you don't know if you're gonna be able to fit the words in properly or not, and you might find you run out of space. So make sure you write the words first and then put the bubble around it. So, so that just gives you a taste 
Why is that important? We're losing our boys' graphic novels are a really big thing. When we're doing this and we're drawing, we're turning on the other part of their brain and we've engaged them through that visual communication and we're connecting them through the writing. And there is an order to um, graphic novels that we're not actually teaching. And graphic novels are the beginning of our new economy with video. The kids that are writing these great graphic novels are going to be the ones that are doing your social media. The power of a sentence and an image together is what we're all having to do at the moment. So these are the fundamental steps in future skills. And then we have animated one of the books. And I thought, again, we're about purpose. And this was written by Zach. It's a factual text. That was the agenda. And you've laid now uh, creative writing with characters coming in here. This is incredibly powerful. We've been sharing this book and other books. So we're kind of, I describe ourselves like YouTube, where we've got this amazing content. We share it with both teachers and kids, and they get to see work created by kids. And now that's the inspiration and the skill set that we're taking. We have been working with a school, and they've got a year's worth of writing outcomes in eight weeks. And that's both for kids that are in the lower socioeconomic and those that are in the higher gifted and talented saw those progress. In six months, we saw three years' worth of outcomes. And a lot of it's to do with this programming and scaffolding. So meet Zach. I'll finish up after that. But I think this is a really interesting idea of what purpose looks like and the entertainment and the capability that we've got around the country. <laughs>
all of us, why they've come here. Just in was... media and I'm really interested in ways to communicate and talk to a, uh, a direct directly to an audience that's interested in the niche topic or um, direction and its capability really and both of those examples were extraordinary in the fact that they are international um, they have an international bridge great okay so you'd like to know a little bit more about that story I suppose the tech side of it is interesting the tech side of it, okay? All right, great. Anybody else? Anybody got some bur any burning questions? You'll have an opportunity um, in a little moment to give your questions as well. But that's a, okay. Well, should we? We'll start with that question, shall we? Sure. Okay. Well, actually, can we? Can we start? Perhaps, I think we're going to answer this, but we start with what was the what was the moment that you had the insight that actually galvanised you into action? Because we all have great ideas, right? But actually moving into action is something else. So yeah. when, when did that happen and, and how did it happen? Uh, I know specifically and I videoed it. Did you? Uh, I didn't know wow. how it was going to be. So uh, my daughter uh, has a chronic pain condition and she has to sometimes have and one of the things is, she can't, I say you can't have tech. So you're having a day off, but you're not then immersing yourself into tech. And so she was doing a word puzzle. And she was doing it with a friend, because I was actually looking after a friend's kid at the same time. I was at home doing what you're doing, which was my work stuff. The question was, what's an oboe? What's an oboe? And it was, what's an oboe? How do you explain what an oboe is? So I went on YouTube, got um, Peter the Wolf from the Russian Orchestra. And these two kids got up instantly and put those connector pencils, textures together, and they started dancing and becoming the flute mm -hmm. and the oboe. And I got it on video. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, they said, Well, what's it about? And I said, It's a story. And it's a story through music. And it's actually about a kid who writes a rock, which is incredibly ironic as the DNA and genesis of what we're describing. And in that moment, they decided that they were going to write their own story. Five hours later, what I was amazed at is these kids had created the bedrooms were now their authorship rooms. <laughs> they had written five books. And I just asked or um, engaged a couple of questions, which was, well, who's going to read it? And then they had to laminate and photocopy them, and they made a production line and stapled them together. And then how much and how are you going to get distributed and get your audience? So they set up a laminate band that stand at the front of the house with a library for when their schoolmates came back from school. And ironically, the friend of mine who was looking after their kids, she's an English teacher in high school, and I'm sending her these text messages, which I'm still kept going for oh, today, and this is what we're doing, and can you believe it? So they ended up producing five different books, photocopying about 100 of them, and distributing them to family and friends. And I went, wow, this is amazing that I did very little in that process, and I'm incredibly proud of what it was. And the first thing I wanted to do was to create what I call a real book. And every application that I looked at wanted to take in someone else's image and someone else's writing and text. I'm like, no, 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 you're not getting it. Right now, this is their best work they've ever done. And anything that I do to change that is disrespectful to that energy, that effort that's gone into it. So I then quickly went down and put, there's no application, realised that there was a, a space in the market and then I actually went and talked to my daughter's teacher and I said, can you talk to me about how this might work in school? And she was like, oh my God, I love it. She came on board and was one of the first people in the school and that's when we started to connect the dots. Wow, that's incredible. I love that. It was an actual use case that came to you. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, and what about you, Claire? I know that you, you were 
following, so you, you were at home, I think, um, with a child, you just dropped out of yeah. your, but your postgrad, not your postgrad, your master's? Yeah, my, yeah. My, similarly to Jenny, it was, I started, started it to solve a problem. And uh, I was, so I was a graduate student in psychology, but I was also writing at the time. I had some op-eds published in the Sydney Morning Herald, and I was interested in writing it. I was working on a long-form article about a psychologist um, called Lee Jussum, who I met in April of 2015, and I, I was working on a very in-depth article. And I, I was extremely um, proud of the article, and, and I knew it was going to be a big hit, but I didn't know where to publish it. And it just didn't fit any publication that I knew of. Um, it was too technical for, you know, The Guardian or something like that, and, and other publications wouldn't have been interested in it because it was too scientific. Like, it just, it didn't fit anything. So I thought, why don't I create the platform that it fits into? Um, and that's what we've done. So we publish mostly long-form commentary, and sometimes we'll publish quite technical articles. Um, but because online publishing is so uh, cheap. It doesn't cost anything for us to put an article up. I mean, it can be technical and it can have, you know, just a couple of hundred people in the world read it. But it's important for us to get that material out there because it contributes to knowledge. It contributes to, you know, intellectual life. So I just knew that there was a gap in the market, a niche for something sort of like a hybrid between academic publishing and mainstream publishing. Yeah. And so that's what I. And you, you certainly scratched a big itch yeah, yeah, and yeah. found something that was yeah. compelling to lots of other um, people. Yeah. And did you have to uh, find and build different technology or did you take technology you know, off the shelf? I've always been quite technologically illiterate to be honest. Um, I just use WordPress, the blogging platform. Uh, I, I don't even know how to code. I just use off the shelf technology. I would say the one thing I did, which is my, my benefit, <coughs> sorry, is that, sorry, <laughs> I built a social media following. Right, yeah, yeah. okay. So I used social media. So you, you built, and as you, as you mentioned, you built the audience yes. first. Yes, yeah. yeah. I'm going to hold that because I'd like to talk about that in a moment. But Jenny, uh, it looks as if you may have built your own tech. Yeah. So, um, why did you decide to do that, and what's been the journey? Right from the get go, I knew it was a platform play. Um, so it was really important that we could deliver something that really worked for all stakeholders. So when you look at other uh, platforms that are out there, that might do it particularly well, but not this particular well. So our stakeholders, for example, are clearly kids, teachers, parents, um, publishing companies, authors, and the global community. That's a really big group of stakeholders, and they all have very different needs. And so we needed to make that user journey for each of those stakeholders work. Um, I also have had a background in emerging technologies, so I was at the forefront in, believe it or not, internet, uh, real time, insurance for Allianz, so that was the first one <laughs> application. And the use case study, um, because it didn't exist there, was a couple of things. Why Australia? Because we could afford the risk. And two little high doctors, quote unquote, including microwaves. So that's um, a little bit scary about when my life started in technology and makes me sound like a dinosaur, which is fine. Um, so I was very comfortable with technology. Uh, teach myself a little bit about it. The framework, I understood the use case, and I understood how to put together a business case for that. So that's a space that I spent a lot of time on. Yeah, and it sounds like it's actually fundamental to your product working. Because, and interesting from a legal perspective, alone, one of the things that we've done, which we believe is also well first, is every child in our platform um, owns the IP, the copyright. And I put to you when you think about any educational activity that your child is doing or potentially doing, who actually owns that mm. and spending a lot of time on that. I've um, read too many legal contracts now and I'm not purely a legal background but I think I understand that space particularly well 
and we've done something that no one else has. And they've either avoided the conversation um, in their legal contracts as a general rule, or not given permis permission for certain ages to participate as authors and to hide their IP. So that was a legal constraint, but it's actually a big drive around that. Yeah, right. It's interesting, isn't it, when you go on your journey and you find that you need different skill sets to the ones that you originally thought maybe you might have needed to be an entrepreneur. Um, both of you are breaking the rules. Uh, you know, Quillette is a platform for free thought, and you know, I've recently found Quillette and found such amazing articles, but I would imagine that they're unlikely to be published anywhere else, really. Um, and you know, a platform for kids and, and having them own their own IP and, and writing their own books, you're breaking the rules. So what's it taken to actually break those rules? Claire, do you want to go? Uh, well, it's sort of just seeing that there are opportunities. Whenever, whenever everyone's doing the same thing or following the same rules, I mean, there's an opportunity there for you to not but to do every, what everyone else is doing. Um, and it, I think it just, it's just seeing the flip side, what could be done if you did break those rules. And yeah, I yeah. love that. That's yeah. really, that's a, a great way of thinking, isn't that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and have you had to endure much, much pushback? Yeah, I, I, I do get asked that question a lot. Um, yeah, the pushback we get occurs because anybody who has a profile, like a public profile, particularly on social media, does get uh, pushback once they reach a certain level of um, success or notoriety. And it's it sort of comes with the territory. And we do publish some controversial, contrarian articles. I wouldn't say that we um, publish polemical articles, but we certainly publish um, you know, politically incorrect sort of stuff, and, and we have definitely received the criticism and pushback, but it comes with the territory. Right. And and pushback is itself a signal of success, because people don't push back mm -hmm. on you if they don't know who you are. Yeah, and if they're not feeling a bit threatened by you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, interesting. What about you, Jenny? I think the biggest driver is, uh, and I'm not sure how aware you are of this, but um, Every year for the last eight years, the ability of our kids to write has gone backwards. 20% of our kids cannot meet the minimum requirement for writing. My daughter is 13 years of age. That means her entire school career, that's the backdrop. We fast forward when she leaves high school. 780,000 kids in this country will leave school and start to contribute to society and the workforce without that ability. Now, it's really easy to talk about the low performing. But the other part of that conversation is our high performing writers, there's less. Our mid group have gone backwards. And so fundamentally, there is nothing okay about that for me. And I see it as a responsibility. And I've got, I'm very passionate about making this a national conversation and saying to people here today, we talk about it's the teacher's responsibility or kids and all it's ours. It's on our watch and we need to be an audience and we need to participate. So what's allowed me and given me permission to do that, frankly, is it's just unacceptable. And it's the most solvable problem. It really is. May I ask you how you got to work with the curriculum, which is incredible. I, I love what you're doing. I love what you're both doing. But how did you infiltrate that situation and are you able to do more? And do you need help to do more and get into those schools quickly and make that difference for our children, particularly children like your daughter who's only 13, and who you feel has been snubbed in a way. You know? Yeah, and, and I'm kind of lucky specifically with my children. She's got who? She's got me, but it's her peers, it's her friends, it's That's her future family, her husband, her lover, whatever it might be, and her girlfriends and boyfriends. I care about them, and I care about the people she's been with and I want for her to have more than that. Um, so the answer is yes, and um, I sit here very clearly, quite humbled with the little sky. It's much bigger than I ever anticipated. And so I say yes to help because this is bigger than us. And we are purely a platform to engage everyone to say, we would love help. 
So what does help look like? I'll give you a few little examples of, to answer that question, how we infiltrated the curriculum. I have gone out and found some of the most extraordinary teachers that have come up with Jo since here. She is an absolute gun and leader in her field. And I can tell you, yeah, absolutely, because what they've done is um, We've created in the last six, I'm going to say um, 16 weeks, over a thousand pages of content connected to the curriculum for every single state and they all have different curriculum. And not just in writing, we're now going into what they call the general capabilities, which is critical thinking, those sorts of things. And a whole range of other things. So I talk about writing, but it covers science. We've got stories in there about kids writing and coding because they're into games. If that's the way I'll hook them in, then that's where we'll go. So um, what, would, what would help look like, if I can answer that, is um, we're really ready now with our product to invite literacy leaders, education leaders, corporations. And one of those examples is we've got a program called the My Life Story. And we've always had a good purpose around our product. And we've worked with Royal Far West Edition Australia. And Royal Far West, we've got a program which is supporting kids under pressure from the drought. And we've gifted the program through coordination with city schools that are sponsoring their country cousins for that book. Andrew Dado's come on board, James Foley. And we all have about 10,000 kids doing that in term one and term two. Those books will be exchanged. We'll hear about the grit, the perseverance, and the reality of the country and vice versa in the city. We've written programs across from kindy to stage four, which is 14 years of age. Um, and we've got corporations that are on board that have sponsored those kids in the country. We just don't want to put any more pressure on the parents <coughs> and the schools. And we want to just say, we want to hear your story. And we would like to work and underpin some literacy outcomes. So there's programs like that that we can just spin out now in a heartbeat. So we're ready to do that. It requires us having big conversations with big thought leaders that are prepared to make big decisions. And frankly, it's that simple. Um, so yeah, if you've got any ideas, love to chat. Plenty of time to network later. Um, so <laughs> all the ideas coming in. Um, Claire, before we move topic a little bit, I wanted to just come back to building an audience with you because um, you know one of the incredible things about publishing in today's world is that you have got a global audience yeah. um, and you know I'm blown away by the fact that only four percent of your unique visitors are coming from Australia so what have been the sort of secrets to your success in terms of building that audience globally yeah that's a good question it, it takes a while to build an audience so I was building my audience on Twitter for a couple of years before I started called it. Um, but so, so I and I know people who are trying to do the same thing. And um, it just takes about a couple of years of interacting on a social media platform, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, whichever it is, um, interacting on a regular basis, um, finding people with the same interests that you have and develop, building a network. So I built a quite robust network of writers, of academics, people who had similar interests to me. They knew who I was, I knew who they were. Um, and then, I, you know, just from activity on Twitter, I got followed by Richard Dawkins. So when I, when I first published an article, it was the very first article I had published on Colette, tweeted it out, and guess who retweets it? And the site crashes. Richard Dawkins. <laughs> so you just you get lucky. Like yeah. social media allows you to make these international connections that you would never have made otherwise. And but it just takes consistency and building it up over time. I, I think that's that's really key, isn't it? Because mm. from my perspective, you know, being a podcast. So I've got a podcast called Don't Stop Us Now, and we've been going for about a year and a half. And, you know, it's hard work, and it, it really does, yeah. you, you have to be consistent, you have to, you, have, you have to publish, you know, when you say you're going to publish, on the day you say you're going to publish, and you have to consistently be connecting with people and creating value. Um, and I think those sort of little 
bits of momentum come, don't they? Yeah. And then, and then that builds and it builds yeah. and yeah. it builds. It, so it compounds. Yeah. The network starts compounding and then suddenly it just takes off. And, you know, it might be a year, it might be six months, it might be two years, but if you keep building and building and building, it suddenly it becomes sort of almost exponential. Yeah, absolutely. It's my, definitely my experience. So moving on just a little bit, just to get into, you know, what it's like to... You know, and how do you manage your lives as entrepreneurs? Um, it takes a lot of resilience, doesn't it? You know, there's there's a lot going on. I, I know I was um, I was on a call with Jenny trying to sort of talk about tonight, and literally the only moment that we could talk to each other was when Jenny was between meetings, and she was telling the Uber driver where to go at the same time as being on a VC. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, you're juggling everything, particularly if you've got a family on top of everything else. So, um, what are your top tips for people in the room here who maybe, you know, they want to think about resilience, they want to think about how they manage everything in their lives? What's worked for you? Jenny? Maybe it hasn't worked for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I pretty much got my business for more than 20 years forms and um, so some things that really work particularly I'm going to put the context of family around that with young children every 20 minutes counts and I break time down into 20 minute lots and when I'm having 20 minutes with Archie and we're playing footy and we're passing that ball or doing whatever it might be he has got me 100% in those 20 minutes and then when Joe and I are talking about a curriculum I'll actually chunk two 20 minute sections together and say that's dedicated to that. So I've really tried to work on every 20 minutes being an incredible moment there. And it's the same for when I want 20 minutes with a bottle of wine and it's... <laughs> 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 you chunk to you 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> maybe three. Or maybe she just make, you know, maybe she carry my talk. So I... I put that structure in place a long time about being really conscious. And is that something that you do, like, do you do, do you write that, that down, or is it something that you've been just using for so long that you, you now your brain can chunk everything down into 20 minutes? Yes, and then when I'm under more pressure, I then go back to being more disciplined with the structure of that 20 minutes. So if I can feel myself going, are you kidding me? <laughs> There's that much. And then I look at what I have to let go of. That would be my second tip is you need to let go of more stuff and you need to pass it on. And one of the things that I find uh, allows me to do that is getting very clear that this is bigger than me personally. It may have been the DNA that started, but this DNA, people want to be part of it. And so surrounding yourself with really capable people that have the same value system allows you to then let go of that 20 minutes. So how do I go? That's and we'll find a 10 going, you can keep a few more in between minutes. Thanks very much now. But that's the other part, is yeah. then deciding do I really need to do that? And I think sometimes we get stuck in what we need to do. Yeah. So that sounds like it's delegating, but is it also saying no? At no delegating, and what you do, do really, really well, and mm -hmm. turn your stuff off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Claire? Yeah, similar, uh, I have similar um, tactics to Jenny. I would also say that it's it's about, it's not about perfection, it's about a process. If we get hung up on all the things we have not achieved or we're not doing, I mean, you're just gonna quit, right? It's it's always a process. There's always more things that you could be doing. Sometimes I like to take stock, um, looking back on what I've done throughout the year, what I've done over the past three years, and, and then, like, I blow my own mind, right? But in the day, like so often on a day-to-day -day basis I'm feeling like overwhelmed or I wish I had more time to do this or do that but then if you stop and take stock over what you actually have done you feel much better and so it's just it's just about letting go of that perfectionistic wanting to have everything nailed down letting go of that and realizing it's all just a journey and it's a process and then having a very meaningful goal a goal that is where you're striving towards something that is bigger than yourself, it's even bigger than the company. It's, it's you know, if you're doing something to benefit society and to benefit other people, that is tremendously motivating, and that's what keeps you coming back. Yeah, so then, and, and you feel it more. more than, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that is a lot of it's about energy, isn't it? 
Yeah, it really is. It's about managing that energy and the, you know, when your cup of overflows because you're really focused on something that you care desperately about, then yeah. it, 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 you can actually do more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, it's the smell or the roses piece when you're doing some stuff. So last week was seriously a pretty full-on week for us. And, uh, but what was fabulous is, you know, on a Sunday night on Twitter, the principal sending me, and she reviews every single report, and they get to do feedback um, through their, their kids' eyes. And so they're summarising, and in, in all these reports, the kids are talking about little scribe. And so we're running around like idiots trying to get these books ready and do all the rest of it. And to start to see that feedback coming up and then to see those books and we've got kids saying, I couldn't write, the teachers saying they're engaged. You just need to spend five minutes on that and go, great, yeah, I can do that again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm aware of time, but I just, I'm going to ask one last question and then I'll go to the audience to see if there are any questions. Uh, but my one last question for you both is, if you could give your 25-year-old self some advice, what would it be? I would say think more creatively about alternative career tracks and don't feel like what's been done for the last hundred years in terms of the professions, like whether it's law or psychology or medicine or whatever. I would say there are lots of different career tracks that you can have now because of technology and I would say uh, learn more about technology, maybe learn to code, just become familiar because the world is changing, it's changing fast and there are all sorts of opportunities and the jobs that are going to exist 5, 10, 20 years from now don't exist now. And so if you're in a position where you can capitalise on those opportunities, you're set. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'll just give a, a quick plug to our podcast because on our podcast, don't stop us now. We actually interview women from around the world who are innovators, pioneers, and original thinkers, and they're doing exactly that. They're 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 doing things differently. Um, I mean, some people are in corporate, but most people aren't. So, if you want some inspiration and some role models, uh, don't stop us now. Anyway, that's my plug over. Um, Jenny, what about you? What's your advice to your twenty-five-year-old self? To my twenty-five-year-old self and to my kids is. The expectation of knowing what you're going to do is the most ridiculous concept you'll ever cross. <laughs> um, when you feel yourself losing time because you're incredibly curious about something and time disappears, you're probably close to being in the right space. And so keep leaning into that sensation and that curiosity and the sense of losing time. And you will then find yourself being successful because of the fulfillment that you get. And that fulfillment will really drive you to get more curious and to find more answers and to build on it. So that would be one um, piece that I'd really say to my 25 year old self is trust that feeling. Yeah. It's a really powerful feeling. Um, and the other piece that I would say is, you know, I sit before you here and I have no qualifications. And so it's incredibly ironic. And so I say to teachers, all around when I'm talking to them. That kid in the class that you didn't get much out to, what's the irony of them turning up with an educational writing platform and wasn't particularly engaged because I really didn't get that real kick. I thought I was there to get a mark on education and I love learning. And so anything that gives you that love of learning and in that period of time, anything's possible. So in that, I've now been lecturing at Sydney Uni for Masters of Publishing. How ironic is that? <laughs> Written for the Sydney Morning Herald and um, done a few things like And who would have thought? So just work with who would have thought. It's all possible. Mm -hmm. Lean into your curiosity and when you're losing time, you're probably pretty well close to what you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. So on that anything's possible last comment. So. I'm going to now throw it to the audience. What questions do you have? We're just going to get the, the microphone to you. Um, hi, for a little scribe, um, I was just really enraptured with Zach's story come to life with, through animation. Um, do you have any plans on doing more of that and bringing stories to life uh, you know, visually? Because that's obviously very powerful and that's probably the first way that children 
view stories, um, or it's, it's a very powerful way for children, you know, accept stories. So do you have a plan to explore that more? Yeah. If not just explore, there's a business plan around that. Um, and maybe I'll come back in six months' time and be able to share more of that with you. But there's absolutely a, a place for that that's turning up now. So we're pretty excited about that. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. And not just for um, the kids, it's both for parents and it's for teachers, and particularly where English is second language. There's a whole piece that we don't know about. Really great presentations from both, thank you. Just wanted to know quickly, how do you monetize your publications or your platforms? Uh, so I have a few different revenue streams. Um, the primary revenue stream is uh, voluntary subscriptions or reader donations. So uh, I get monthly donations from readers. I get, uh, I think there's 3,000 readers who subscribe monthly and then occasionally I'll run a crowdfunding campaign where I'll send out a mass newsletter or an email that goes to all of our subscribers saying, look, um, this is why you should donate to us, you should give us money for this. And those campaigns are actually quite successful. Um, and so we'll get a big injection of cash that way. And then I supplement that with a bit of ad revenue from advertising, and then occasionally we'll have little events which also generate money. So, and then we have merchandise, but that doesn't generate that much. But the the idea is to have very various different um, revenue streams. So. so we have five different um, approaches to that. We've got our freemium model, which is allowing any teacher or journey yourselves to go and create your own book with your own IP, if that makes sense. The platform's allowing you to create a digital uh, book, share it, do some things like that. You can then opt in to buy that as a physical, so you've got the product piece that's turning up. The second is we've got a subscription model, which is the co-op of the program, and that ranges from around $15 to $18 per child per <coughs> And then we've got a premium portfolio. So outside of what we've talked about, we're now creating a portfolio for life where that child's writing journey stays with them from year on year so that teachers can actually see that progress. And in, in that, we're also connecting to assessment and we're collecting the data around that pro process for that child. So that has another subscription model. Um, and then the sort of outlier is our good program. So we then have agreements with not for profits and we bring corporates in to invite and say, would you like to sponsor a kid? So the funding actually goes through to the not-for-profit through this platform that we've uh, collaborated with, and they get the tax deduction, and then they're sponsoring a child in a program that we're doing under the business structure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Claire and Annie, and thanks for today. Um, I just was, I both talked a lot about time, and I suppose, and how precious time is, and really good to talk about the 20 minutes cutting into time. And I'm recently a people leader myself, and that's one thing that I've found, a commodity that's hard to come by. And I suppose, have you got any tips as to how to communicate that to somebody else if they feel like you're almost taking too much of your time? And, and any tips in the business world of how you get around that? That offending people. <laughs> haven't mastered that yet. <laughs> I've actually spent a lot of time on that, um, interestingly. So um, I, I catch up once a month with a group that are uh, behavioural um, scientists. And so I'll answer that for different uh, scenarios. With my, ch my children, one of the things that I find is if they're looking and looking for more time, that specifically if I'm doing something and they know that I'm in that 20 minute zone, and I'm talking, and they're coming up. It's I start with this, and so I anchor it, and I'm giving them the physical cue that I know you're there. I know that's important, but I actually need to pinch this completion that's right here. And they will now, because I've repeated that process for so long, just stand there very calmly, or know that they've been acknowledged, and will know, go back and do what they're doing, and come back. And then I will always go and complete that need that they've got. So that's a kid oriented one. Uh, let's go to um, John. I was just talking today. We've got some talkers in our team. We like to communicate. Of course, we're literacy, we're storytellers. Um, and so one of the things is being really upfront, and I have to be honest, I think sometimes communication, we, when we, we tend to sort of talk around it. So being very specific and saying, right now, I'm under the pump with time. What do you need? How can I help you? 
and if you need a longer conversation, can we do that? And so not waiting for the story to come out, <laughs> putting it out there, and then going, oh my God, I actually can't do that now. <laughs> so um, I've just learned to try and be really clear on that. And then what am I doing to set up in a team or other environments so that they understand that language? Because not everyone does, and they're not used to that threat. So again, we have a conversation about um, how we're transitioning people to understand those different techniques and times. Thanks, Just a suggestion. Um, uh, one of the ideas might be to have a physical book and possibly um, have augmented reality. Uh, so I went to CBIT and um, there was children's books and when you um, looked at it through your phone then the augmented reality came up. Uh, that also intersects with um, the drive and telecommunications where you start to actually, instead of having a Skype call, you have an augmented reality call as well. So you can potentially have a communication about your book um, and your character would come up. And if mum is, you know, working somewhere else, um, then you can actually connect in that regard. Suggestions? Always open to good ideas and experimentation. That's actually one of the things that we talk about is the 40s. So we talk about experiment, expand and explore. And that empowers um, design, deliver and do. Often feels like a demanding. So that's a great example of the ease and what we do in the team. Any other questions? Got one from here? Yeah, I was just wondering, with the bushfires and the increasing environmental crises that we're facing, um, just what effect that's having on your, what, 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 what's coming up in terms of what people, what the children are talking about or what your readership is wanting, what you're producing or planning to produce? Yeah, great question. So um, the reason, one of the reasons that um, that program is very personal to me is I was one of those kids and I went to a primary school with six kids in the country. And I went to a drought and we were through a state emergency bushfire where we got wiped out. So I lived that through the eyes of an eight and a 12 year old twice. And this is what I can tell you, and this is what I'm hearing from the principals that we're chatting to now. The kids are quiet. They understand the pressure that mum and dad is under. And so they don't want to add to it. And so we're not hearing their stories. And we're not actually giving them the space to talk about what's going on. And they're getting up early and they're feeding animals and they're getting up late, they're going to bed late to do things. So they're, they're understanding the magnitude of that and the energy. So this program is one of the things that was really um, important for us to talk about. We use the words, a lot of people talk about make it fun. I'm like, no, it's got to, the word purpose is important because it's talking down to kids that everything's fun. You can have a really important message about the environment. You can have a message about what it is. So it's purposeful. And that may be fun. That's actually valid. So the first point I'd say is we're hearing that this is a really important outlet for the kids to have a voice and to actually unpack it. We spent a lot of time in the program talking about anxiety and how we can identify that and help teachers identify that in their writing. And then the other part for the teachers and the principals is it's just the idea that someone wants to hear their story and that there's no pressure for the, the principal to find funding. There's no pressure to have to ask mum and dad to go and get the money to be part of that really incredible program. It means that, and they would find the money and they'd go with something else because they'd never want their kids not to have that education. That then turns up where they're celebrating with those physical books turning up and they've got something joyful and they're really proud of what their kids have done and they're actually hearing their kids' stories and now they're connecting. So that's a really specific thing. And from that, we're actually getting recommendations from kids, and we've seen this in books, how they want the environment to look, how they think they should be, we should be looking at education, what the science and the tech really looks like in communication. So there's some really interesting feedback that's coming back from here. So what are we hearing? It looks like help. Yeah, what are we hearing? We want to be connected. That's probably the most important thing. We want to be heard, we want to be connected. Well, um, we have a more international focus, um, and I one thing that I've been surprised by uh, are the amount of young. My young people are more like university students rather than primary school kids, 
we've had so many university students from Hong Kong, Ryan, Iran, even Iran. So places where there's political unrest, there are young people trying to speak to the world. They want people in the United States or Australia or Canada or the UK to hear their story about what's happening because they're living in uh, oppressive regimes where they might not have press freedom and they want to get their stories out. And that has been very moving for me to witness. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. This was a wonderful um, conversation and exploration of two amazing women who are using platforms to publish out to the world and to really change the world. So I hope you join me in thanking them for their time and their ideas. I'd like to thank you all for attending our final quarterly event for the Studio Women's Network this year. We will be holding it again in 2020, and I'd like to invite you all to join us next door for networking and drinks. Thank you.